ribs. I've never had a broken rib, but uh, people who have have told me it's very painful. Apparently, God considers those things to be very important, and so when they break, that's serious. And, and, and the same thing with spiritual truth. God considers spiritual truth to be very important. And if we break spiritual truth, we put the church and our individual Christian lives in danger. So it's important that we look at what the ribs are. That is, what are the key things in the Christian church, in the Christian teaching? And last week we began, because this is Reformation Month, the month that we remember the Reformation, October 31, 1517. Last week we had one of the key ribs, teachings of the Reformation, sola fides, faith alone. They used Latin a lot back then in the 1500s. Sola fides, faith alone. And along with that, sola gratia, grace alone. That is, I cannot be a Christian unless, as we heard this morning in Mark's prayer, unless God comes in his grace and he loves me, chooses me. We sang that. He has chosen me. We are chosen. And he works his love. He works his, his compassion, his salvation in us. The Holy Spirit comes in and begins working in my dead heart, and we call that regeneration. And then I just open up my mind, my heart, my life, and I say, yes, I want your love, and that's faith. And so grace is God loving me. Faith is my loving God back, accepting him, trusting him. And so it's grace alone. I can't do it on my own. He's got to do it. Grace alone, and then faith alone, not by works, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, so that no one can boast. Faith alone, grace alone. But then the third part of the Reformation was sola scriptura, scripture alone. And what the reform, <coughs> and I say reformers, <coughs> I say reformers because even though we quite often attach the Reformation to Martin Luther, there were many that came before him, during him, and after him. Many reformers, many who wanted to change the church as it had become corrupt and dead. And they wanted to bring new life to the church. And, and, so, and so the reformers taught sola gratia, grace alone, sola fides, faith alone, but also sola scriptura, scripture alone. And they taught that. They taught that because, because they believed that the church had become corrupted in that, in that it was adding too many things to the basic Christian gospel things that, that theologians were cooking up in their own mind or things that they were simply drawing out of tradition and establishing as biblical Christian truth, even though you couldn't find it in the Bible. And they said, it, it, it's got to just be the Bible, not human beings, not human rationality, not tradition. It, it's got to be just the Bible. And so some of the things that were going on in the, in the church back hundreds of years ago, in the 1500s, the, the reformers began to, to question. For example, the idea that the bread and the wine changes into the body and blood of Christ. They, they challenged that. They said, we can't find it in the Bible. Or that the Virgin Mary was born without sin. It was called the Immaculate Conception. They said, we can't find that in the Bible. Or the idea that the Pope could speak Biblical truth, inerrant truth. They said we can't find that in the Bible. In fact, we can't even find a pope in the Bible. Now, I'm not saying these things to, to knock the, the, the Catholic Church because we love Catholic people and, and believe that the Catholic Church today is, is brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm, I'm talking about history. I'm telling you what, what the Reformers were saying. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just giving you a piece of history here. They said, look, th these things and many others, we can't find them in the Bible. 
And, and, and there's a real danger with that, they said. There's a real danger in, in, in kind of drawing out of tradition and in human ideas and, and, and ideas from the popes and the bishops. There's a danger there that we're going to begin to drift far away from the central teachings of the Bible. And so we got to get back to the Bible, the Bible alone, because the Bible, they said, is the source of truth, and only the Bible. Sola Scriptura. They said the Bible has a certain power in it. You see, if you go back to the origins of the church, if you go back way back to the, to the 100s and the 200s and the 300s, when, when the church was, was evolving and developing, the church at that time was gathering the books that would later become the 66 books that we call Bible or Scripture. And, and they had to have standards. Well, what's a standard for a Bible book? Why, why would we take this book and lay it aside and say, nope, that's not the Word of God, and this one, yep, it is. And one of the standards, there were others, but one of the standards was that, that the book had to have a certain, what they called dunamis. They liked Greek and Latin. The Greek word dunamis, dynamic, it means power. The book has to have a certain power in it because if it was written by the Holy Spirit and if the Holy Spirit has regenerated my heart, then when I read it, I, I ought to have a certain experience. I, I ought to have the feeling that God is speaking to me. It's got to have that power. It's got to have that truth. It's got to have that energy in it. And, and so they began to develop, the reformers began to develop more and more a doctrine or a position or a teaching on what the Bible is and what the Bible ought to be for us and for the church. In fact, let, let's do a little catechism here. I don't know how many of you grew up in the church and went to catechism, but, but one of the words that you probably learned was the word inspiration. It means to breathe into. The word spiro or spirit means breath. And so inspiration means to breathe in. The Holy Spirit breathed into the Bible writers what God wanted them to write. And if you studied that in your catechism class, you probably came across certain key Bible passages. For example, 2 Timothy chapter 3.16. In that Bible passage, the Apostle Paul is talking to the, to the uh, pastor named Timothy. And he says, Timothy, uh, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. Timothy had learned it from his mother and his grandmother. The Apostle Paul goes on to say, how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. Now, notice Holy Scriptures there. That's the Old Testament. It's the Old Testament. And, and look at what the Apostle Paul says about the Old Testament. You see, the New Testament, when Timothy was an infant, hadn't yet been written. He says, the scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation. You can learn about salvation from the Old Testament. It doesn't have neat little passages in it like John 3.16, like the New, but you can certainly learn about salvation from the Old Testament. That's what the Apostle Paul says you can learn about salvation from the Old Testament through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture, now the word Scripture means what is written down. It comes from the Latin word scripto, like scripto pens, to write. So the Holy Spirit breathed the truth into the Bible writers and they wrote it down. They inscripturated it. They wrote it down. And so that's what, in fact, the word Bible comes from the Greek from the Greek word biblos, which means book. So the word of God, the truth of God, the message from God was breathed by the breath of God into the Bible writers, and they wrote it down, scripture, into a book. So anyway, moving on with that, that passage, all what is written down, breathed into the writers by God, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting. Oh, see that word God breathed? That's the word in, in the original language, inspired, inspiration. There it is, right there. 
All scripture is inspired, God breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And that's you and that's me, servants of God. We need the scripture to be equipped for every good work. Uh, the apostle Peter says the same thing. In first, second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, 19 through 21, he says, we also have the prophetic message. Prophecy means to speak the word of God as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place. Christy this morning talked about how the devil might try to isolate us and convince us of wrong things. Well, that's a dark place, so the light has to shine into the dark place. Uh, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no word of God, no prophecy written down of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. No, no, no. For God's word, prophecy, never had its origin in human will, but the prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were inspired, breathed into carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, in this passage also, when Peter talks about the Scriptures, he is talking about the Old Testament. Because the New Testament either was just starting to be written or it wasn't written yet. So you say, well, does the New Testament declare that it is the Word of God? And the answer is yes. Look at what Paul, the Apostle, says in 1 Thessalonians. Those of you that are in the women's Tuesday night Bible study group and in those of you who are men in the Wednesday morning men's group, we've been studying 1 Thessalonians. And in chapter 2, verse 13, the Apostle Paul says, We thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but what it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. So the words of the Apostle Paul are the Word of God, and when he wrote them down, Scripture, they became Bible, the Word of God, Scripture. And, and, and if you went to catechism, you would probably learn some of those terms. And I thought it just might, might kind of be good to review and refresh, and if you never heard these terms before, just to be aware of how the Reformers and Christian teachers after them have developed a, a teaching on the Bible. For example, the word inspired, to breathe. God breathed into the Bible writers. And, and, and he didn't just breathe into them in the sense of a, of a secretary typewriter kind of thing, uh, what is sometimes called the typewriter or the dictation theory that God just dictated and they kind of wrote it down. But God dealt with them as organs, the Bible writers as organic. It's called organic inspiration that he breathed into them the words, it's called verbal inspiration, the words and the ideas that he wanted, but he let them write it in their own style. It's kind of like somebody who would sit down, uh, this morning we had Carol Lee at the keyboard. Now when she plays, she's got the notes in front of her, but how it comes out is gonna be according to her style, how she plays. And so God gave the notes to the Bible writers, but as they played it, it came out in their own kind of style. And so, and so Revelation with the Apostle John, lots of symbolism, oh, figures of speech, just full of it. And yet you get to the writings of the Apostle Paul, lots of doctrine, lots of official teaching. And then you get Job, and you have lots of poetry. And then the Psalms, those are songs. And then you get kings, that's history. So there's a lot of style in, in the Bible, a lot of variety, and God permitted them to write it as long as it was his words in their own way. Occasionally picking maybe their own words, organic, and, and, it's called, and it's called plenary inspiration. So it's not that just parts of the Bible are inspired and we can rip this page out or take this book out or, or maybe just have this part of the Bible or that part, but it's plenary. That means the entire Bible, all 66 books that were gathered and recognized by the church are the Word of God 
and our scripture and and also the necessity of scripture that is if you're going to be saved you got to have the bible you can't get saved just by holy, having the holy spirit in your heart you've got to have the message along with the spirit word and spirit word and spirit and, and you also need the word in order to understand god's other message his creation so when you look at little uh, bunny rabbits and, and brooks and streams and trees and, and when you use your reason, rationality, uh, you, you've got to understand how those are the creation of God, first of all, by understanding it through the eyes of Scripture. So those are the words. Those are the ideas. Those are the teachings that come out of the Reformation. But there is an interesting question and problem and the question and problem is this okay so I'm a reformer and I say oh medieval church church of the 14 and the 1500s you have incorporated too much of your own thinking human ideas tradition you you, you have corrupted the Word of God by by putting in extraneous material you're, you're teaching things that aren't really accurate and correct according to the Bible so, so we're, we're going to reject that now, and, and we're going to say that you bishops and popes and clergy, you know, you, you can't do that. So we're going to, you know, Bible alone, sola scriptura, just scripture. We stand alone in the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, as the old Bible school song says. Okay, good. But now here's the problem. It's going to be Bible alone, but the Bible is not always clear. The Bible is not always simple to read and not always simple to understand. Take the book of Revelation or, or, or getting into things like Ecclesiastes or even the doctrine taught by the Apostle Paul. Exactly what does this mean? So the question comes, who's going to teach it? Who's going to decide what the Bible actually says? See, see, we're not going to, we're, okay, no, tradition and bishops and popes and all, no, 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 no. The Bible alone. Oh, oh, but what does the Bible say? And you know what the reformers began to do? The reformers began to tell the congregations what the Bible says. You see it? You see the issue here? And so what began to happen was we got away from the popes and the bishops and all of that telling the people what the Bible supposedly said, and now we've got the reformers, Calvin, Luther, Zwingli, Philip Melanchthon, telling the people what it says. Now, I'm not saying that they were wrong, but the thing is, you, you once again have church leaders, and that sometimes got to be sticky. Because if the church leader over here in Zurich Switzerland, like Ulrich Zwingli was saying one thing, but over here in Munich, Germany, somebody was saying something different. They got mad at each other. In fact, in Zurich, when Ulrich Zwingli taught one thing and then the Anabaptists rose up in that same city and began to teach something a little bit different, it was on the matter like a baptism, whether or not you should only immerse believers or if you could sprinkle babies. They began to kill each other. They began to kill each other or put each other in prison because you don't agree with what this reformer, this church leader is saying. So are we really escaping the, the, the problem over here? And, and, and to add to the problem, the reformers taught something called the priesthood of all believers. They said, you people are your own priests. You do not need to have a priest to stand between you and God. You don't need me, for example. You don't need a minister, a pastor, a priest, a bishop, a pope to stand between you and God. You can come directly to the Lord, worship. We did it this morning. Worship, praise, pray, confess, receive salvation. You can talk to God and get saved right in your own bedroom, sitting at your own kitchen table. You don't need the church, you don't need a priest, you don't need a minister, 
You just need the Holy Spirit and the Bible. That's it. Now, now, hopefully you're going to have some need for us. But you don't need us to communicate with God. Now, if you are your own priest, then can't you just read the Bible on your own? You and God, and come to your own teaching, your own understanding? But see, the reformers weren't so ready to do that. So they kind of fell into the same trap as what they were trying to get away from. So when we formed New Community Church, we said, what are we supposed to teach now? What, what are we supposed to believe? Are we going to be more Baptist or more Lutheran or more Calvinist or are we going to be more... Pentecostal, or I mean, because each one of those, though they believe sola scriptura, Bible alone, they have different directions and different emphases and different teachings. And for example, if you grew up Christian Reformed or Reformed, it could very well be that you got baptized when you were a baby by putting having water put on your head. You can't find a Bible passage that specifically and literally teaches that. And if you were brought up Baptist, you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. How about that, huh? Hmm, oh, right, yeah. That's why we immerse only believers. Ah, but wait a minute. If you were brought up Baptist, you were taught that there's a rapture and then a seven-year tribulation left behind, you know what? The seven-year tribulation, the seven-year tribulation, books have been written about it, ministers preach about it, John Hagee on television preaches about it, you gotta get ready for it, you gotta hopefully avoid it, hopefully miss it, movies have been made about it, you know what? You cannot find one Bible passage that specifically and literally contains the seven-year tribulation. Not there. Not there. Now, I know, be it infant baptism by sprinkling or the tribulation, you can glean things and interpret and put this together with that and so forth and Daniel chapter 9 and the idea of the covenant and so on. And Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I know that. I know. In fact, in fact, I believe that that those are very respectable things to do, but you can't find a Bible passage. You can't find a Bible passage that says you ought to build church buildings. Can't find one, but we do it. There's, there's things that we think and do. And for example, the Bible says bread and wine. We use grape juice. Well, you know, it's kind of the same thing. Whether or not to send your children to the Christian school? What should your attitude to be towards television and social media? What political party, if any, should you belong to? You know, Easter and Christmas are not in the Bible. And yet, look at what we do with them. Look at how we celebrate them. By the way, some churches don't. They don't. I know a person, for example, who would be horrified if you suggested that she and her family would bring a Christmas tree into the house and exchange presents. Not in the Bible. So going back, New Community Church, here's what we said, and here's what we still say. You cannot compromise the key teachings of the Bible, God, and salvation, which have been part of the church since the beginning. Not just the 1500s, not just since the Reformation, but from the beginning. Jesus, the Son of God, Savior, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, salvation by faith, that I'm a sinner and I need salvation, that there is a heaven, there is a hell, that I need to do good works and lead a Christian life, the Ten Commandments, Cannot be compromised. So if somebody wants to join this church and be a member of this church, and they say, they say, 
I think Jesus was just a good guy, and we have to follow his example. And when we die, we just kind of die like a dog and get buried. That's not Christianity. We don't say, oh, we accept, we accept, we accept, we accept everybody, we accept everybody. No, no, no. There are standards. There are standards, and they're in the Bible, to be saved by faith, Romans 1, 16 and 17. Romans 3, that we're all sinners. That Jesus suffered and died for us, Isaiah 53. It's all in the Bible, and these things cannot be compromised. But beyond what is a salvation issue, we as a staff like to talk about what is and what is not a salvation issue. Beyond a salvation issue, you are your own priest. Whether or not you're going to watch the Lions today, I don't even know if they're playing today, but if they are, if, if you drink a beer, smoke a cigarette, what kind of clothes you wear, like if you wore a tie today or jeans, how you celebrate Easter and Christmas, whether or not you do, whether you send your children to the Christian school, if you get sprinkled or immersed, we say to the people at New Community Church, you are your own priest. And when it is not a salvation issue, you may read the Bible in your own way. And we're not going to give you a hard time. The critical issues that cannot be compromised, yep. But beyond that, see, in addition to being the source of truth and salvation, and how we view the world. John Calvin, I've got a book about John Calvin, said some very interesting things about the Bible. I'd like to conclude this morning with some of the things Calvin said. Because sometimes we think John Calvin, one of the great reformers out of the 1500s was stuffy and dry. But really, well, listen to him. He says, the scriptures are like spectacles. And I mentioned that some months ago, and I said, those of you under 50, those are glasses. Okay, he says, this is John Calvin, now, reformer, 1500s. He says, just as old or bleary-eyed people and those with weak vision, if you thrust before them a most beautiful book, even if they recognize it to be some sort of writing, yet they can scarcely construe two words. But then with the aid of spectacles, we'll begin to read distinctly. In the same way, Scripture, gathering up the otherwise confused knowledge of God in our minds, Scripture dispenses with our dullness and clearly shows us the true God. Neat, nice. Or he, he says in terms of the purpose of the Bible, the centrality of its teaching, he says, the Bible was not given to us to satisfy our foolish curiosity and pride. No, no, no. The Apostle Paul says the Bible is useful. We read that out of 2 Timothy. Useful for what? Calvin says the Bible is useful to instruct us in sound doctrine, to comfort us, to inspire us, to make us able to perform every good work. And if anyone asks us what constructive power, remember dunamis, we expect to receive from it, the answer can be given in one sentence, that through the Bible, we learn to place our trust in God and to walk in love and faith and fear of him. Or I like to think of it this way. You know how it is if you have somebody you really love and they're an old friend? The more you love them and the more you're with them, the more you want to be with them. I like being with my wife. <coughs> Yesterday we went up north, look at the colors. That was great. Just, we were together. We're the family. Just so good. If you really care about somebody, you, you look forward to being with them. No, think then of the Bible as being like an old friend. But now you know, if you have an old friend, you got to get together with them. And get together, together with them means you read it, and then you reread it, till after a while, 
It just feels so good. Your word is a lamp to my feet. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. In the beginning, God, you go back and you read these passages, and it's like being with an old friend. Is the Bible your old friend? Personal treasure? It will be that if the Holy Spirit is working in you. And if you get together with this good friend, would you stand? And know that through the Spirit and the Word, He will be with you. And He will bless you. He will be with you and he will bless you. The Spirit will live in you. And his word will nourish you and give you peace. Amen. Good morning.